Well, welcome everybody. I know we have not just our um, Evidence-Based Practice Center colleagues uh, on this webinar today, but we have colleagues from other evidence synthesis and guideline programs throughout the U.S., um, uh, including our USPSTF colleagues and GIN North America, PCORI, Cochrane, um, many others. Uh, so uh, welcome. This is the third um, and final in our uh, series of grand rounds for this calendar year, recognizing the uh, ARC Evidence-Based Practice Center program's 25th anniversary. Uh, so we're excited about the presentation we have for you today. Can I have the next slide? I just wanted to take a moment uh, to let you all know, for those who are less familiar with the ARC Evidence-Based Practice Center program, we have a website that we've put up recognizing um, uh, some of the achievements uh, of all who have uh, participated in the EPC program over the last 25 years. So we'd encourage you to, to go to that website. Um, and read more. We also have the first two grand rounds from this series uh, posted on that website uh, with the um, related YouTube link. We also had the honor of uh, writing a blog this year as well for World Evidence-Based Healthcare Day. Um, and it's on that site. And the blog is about uh, the Evidence-Based Practice Center program's 25-year uh, journey. Um, and some of our plans for the future. So uh, don't hesitate to go and, and read more about the program if you're interested. Next slide. I also want to take just a moment uh, to share with you all um, an ARC challenge that was recently released uh, that I thought this community might be particularly interested in. Can you hit the next uh, slide, Celia? Yeah, that's great. That's great. So this challenge is on the ARC website currently. And the challenge uh, is to all healthcare systems, but also payers, electronic health record vendors who have interest in leveraging healthcare system data uh, along with systematic review findings from an ARC systematic review um, to strengthen decision making. So the, the proposals, um, for the first round are due in early January. And if you think you might have some interest, I'd encourage you to, to learn more. Next slide. I did want to take a minute uh, to recognize Karen Scholis. Um, many of you, uh, particularly in our Evidence-Based Practice Center program, may know Karen well. Um, Karen passed away. Uh, uh, October 31st of this year, um, after being uh, diagnosed and, and treated for a period of time for advanced cancer. And I was told she passed away peacefully. Um, uh, Karen was the director of the ECRI Institute Evidence-Based Practice Center just outside of Philadelphia, PA for over 15 years. And she spent um, about the last four years uh, of her career at ECRI uh, as a vice president for their clinical excellence and patient safety portfolio. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Karen um, when Karen and I worked together to form the ECRI Institute Penn Medicine ARC Evidence-Based Practice Center back in 2012 and had the pleasure of working with her uh, closely in that role for, for six years. Um, and learn so much from her and, and consider her not just uh, a friend, but an important mentor in my career. Um, I, I uh, attribute where I am today literally to um, uh, Karen's generosity uh, and uh, her mentorship uh, as uh, we uh, partnered as an ARC Evidence-Based Practice Center. Many of you may not know that the, the first half of Karen's career, uh, she spent as an internist and geriatrician in the Boston area. She uh, started a community uh, residency program in Salem Hospital uh, in the 80s where Mass General internal medicine residents would rotate. And uh, she was an internist in the, the Harvard Pilgrim Health um, uh, clinics uh, for many years and was chief of community medicine for Hebrew Senior Life, uh, which was part of, I believe, Beth Israel Deaconess. Um, 
Uh, so that was the first part of her career. Then she got a master's degree uh, from the Harvard School of Public Health and started the, the second part of her career at ECRI. So, so she'll be missed. Next slide. Uh, this is just a slide uh, for those of you who know less about the Evidence-Based Practice Center program if, uh, if you have interest in learning more. Next slide. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our, our speaker for today. Um, uh, many of you know uh, Evelyn Whitlock, uh, particularly from her role uh, leading evidence reviews uh, in the EPC program uh, for the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force program for many years. Uh, Evelyn uh, led the Kaiser Arc Evidence-Based Practice Center um, from 2012 uh, until um, 2015, where she became a chief science officer for PCORI. And the first part of Evelyn's career uh, was as a primary researcher in women's health and preventive medicine uh, at uh, Kaiser's Research Center in Portland, Oregon. Um, and she then became a core staff and ultimately um, associate director of the Oregon Evidence-Based Practice Center, uh, where she was leading USPSTF uh, reviews that inform USPSTF guidance before she started uh, the Kaiser Evidence-Based Practice Center in 2012. So we're really fortunate to have uh, Evelyn here today to speak um, not just about her experience in the Evidence-Based Practice Center program, uh, but also her experience on the research funder side uh, at PCORI. And we also have the pleasure of having Mark Helfand um, uh, moderate this discussion. Uh, he'll be interviewing uh, Evelyn as part of this presentation. I think. You all know Mark Helfand, who's a professor at OHSU. He's currently director of the Scientific Resource Center uh, for the Evidence-Based Practice Center program at ARC, uh, and has had uh, leadership roles in the VA Evidence Synthesis Program, and was formerly the director of the OHSU EPC program. So um, we're uh, enthusiastic about uh, Mark interviewing Evelyn. So I'll, I'll pass it on to you both. Thanks for being here. Okay, well, thanks, Craig. Um, Evelyn, welcome back. Hi. <laughs> um, it's, it's been 25 years. Well, since you've been in the program. Well, no, it's since, been, we, since, since we started the since program. Since we started, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I may say a thing like that later, but we'll see. <laughs> so uh, we're going to start out, uh, as, as, as Craig said, as an interview. And, and um, I think the first thing would be to say, uh, you know, let's go back 25 years. What were you doing? What kind of research were you doing before the EPC program started? Well, um, <clears throat> before before I answer your question, I just want to uh, say I see so many people in the audience that have been treasured colleagues and friends. And so I wish we were in the same room, but I'm delighted to see you virtually. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I was uh, my research career was at the Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Research here in Portland, Oregon. and um, I, it is a it was a great place to do research and um, because we were a uh, multidisciplinary primarily a PhD shop that started in health services research and then expanded out into clinical research so I had the great opportunity there we were also uh, part and parcel within um, a delivery organization although we were self-funded and it was a place where electronic uh, medical records came in early, where there was an appreciation of the importance of health record data and administrative data even before uh, we had EPIC uh, in-house. And it was a place where uh, we really knew the importance of the denominator. So all of those things made it a great place. And there, when I was there, I had the benefit of um, doing randomized controlled trials, um, being part of, and mo most of those were actually healthcare system centered. So we were randomizing clinics or we were randomizing individuals at the point of usual care. Um, we were uh, working in um, large uh, multi-site clinical trial collaboratives. 
So there were many opportunities for that kind of actual trial research of different designs, as well as using health records and administrative records in order to um, do important research. One, uh, one thing I'll cite just in terms of the administrative and health records was some work we did with CDC, which was very interesting to try and create an algorithm to identify women during pregnancy in order for there to be study of the actual uh, health effects of pregnancy on women's health as opposed to just labor and delivery or the effects on the infant. So that was a really exciting um, uh, piece of work that we did with CDC. So it was a range of uh, clinical um, research that we did, that I was doing prior to getting into the EPC program. I'll finish that by saying one of the great parts of that was um, once you've been inside a protocol, once you've delivered a protocol, you have a, a greater feeling for where things can go wrong. And so I felt that my critical appraisal skills were really supported by having done primary research. Um, so we, we actually, uh, can, that brings us up to the beginning oh. of the EPCs. Okay. And uh, you joined the first EPC-1, they call it now. We didn't call it that then because it was the only one. That's true. <laughs> and, um, and we put in a proposal along with uh, Heidi Nelson to do work for the Preventive Task Force. And I guess the red line on the graph began. It did. So, um, so let's stay with the EPC, the early, you know, the, the EPC part of your career for a second. Um, you, you did mention how your research background, uh, you know, kind of helped you with the EPC work. How about being in a health system? Did that, was that relevant to your EPC work later? Well, I think, I think being in a health system, um, we were, we were in it, uh, I, I would say that it always kept the focus on um, more pragmatic um, solutions and applied information. Um, so I, I think that definitely influenced um, the work that we did. It gave us also ready access to um, a number of um, on-the-ground experts, so people that were actually in the field, and, and that can be extremely helpful and important. And uh, just, just along those lines, a lot of the people at the Center for Health Research got involved in the EBC work. That's true. So hadn't done secondary kind of the red line kind of work. Right. Any thoughts about how that affected the rest of their work or the life at the CHR? Oh, I think um, I think that the the opportunity to get involved in the EPC work and then to build build it as the red line shows um, and to involve a number of people. I think a number of people um, built careers um, within the EPC work, really talented uh, people, some of my colleagues that are on the phone right or on the, the call right now. Um, I think others, there were other opportunities where the EPC capacity allowed some of my colleagues um, by us joining together to get funding in areas where there was a call for both primary research and synthesis capacity. And so there were great opportunities for us. And then we also have the, I think, the luxury of bringing in um, expertise that we might not have had in our team, such as behavioral psychology, social psychology, economics, you know, and, and experts in other areas. So I think that was, it was a, a give and, and, and uh, take kind of situation. In the early years, we did uh, quite a few really um, cost effectiveness analyses alongside reviews that were done by CH, uh, CHR economists. So mm -hmm. it's a, it, was, it was a real asset to the, I think so. to the program. I, mean, I think so. And I think the partnership between OHSU and Kaiser and the VA was a, brought together strengths from different institutions. Yeah. So now we're going to go on the part of the red line that has the slope of about positive one, I think, here, mm -hmm. and uh, talk about the task force work. I mean, those were, that was obviously one of your main focus areas, and as part of that, there was a lot of methods work. Yeah. And uh, just for the audience who may not be familiar with all of this, uh, you know, um, uh, in 2002, um, you developed the analytic framework for behavioral counseling interventions, which was updated in 2014 and 2015, and 
Annals of Internal Medicine, I think, and AJPM, respectively. Um, in 2008, you led, uh, I would say, a pioneering paper on using existing systematic reviews and reviews of complex interventions, if you will, complex, more complex systematic reviews. And in 2009, you led the EPC's work when it was in the CER comparative effectiveness era on identifying, selecting, and refining topics for, for CER. And by the way, that wasn't just a methods paper. Uh, Evelyn almost single-handedly developed the topic triage process that we're still using a form of today to select topics for comparative effectiveness reviews. Um, during that period of time when she did that, my job was to keep everybody, uh, uh, sort of distract everybody so that they wouldn't be <laughs> asking her how it's going. And she took, I think, three months to do it. And We negotiated a hiatus. <laughs> I don't know if that's ever been done in the history of the agency, but we negotiated it. Yeah. I think there was payback for the agency. Don't you oh, think? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So so it must have been, I know, it was exciting work. And, and I wonder, I think it was very, successful work and and I just wonder what you attribute that success that you know period of, of methods productivity yeah in, uh, to, uh, what, what do you attribute it to what do you what do you think about it um, <clears throat> I've thought a lot it's been this has been a great opportunity um, uh, Stephanie Chang talked about having distance makes it easier to look at history but I think what made that work successful and in, and the other work that was done for the USPSDF is that it was needs driven. I think um, being up against um, problems and whether it was the topic triage process or you know the need to move into behavioral counseling and with the same rigor that screening services were being treated by the USPSDF or using existing systematic reviews in complex reviews, all of those were needs driven developments. And, and they usually were both reflecting the need of the stakeholder, and I would say the task force has been enormously important because of the thought leader aspect of the task force along with their methodologic rigor, enormous partners in, in innovation. But it was all needs driven. So, and let me get, just give an example. So the paper about using existing systematic reviews in complex systematic reviews, that was, came straight out of a task force reviews, we started noticing in the search process that for one topic, we would have two existing systematic reviews. With, for the next year, we'd have six, and then the next year we had 16, and it was going that way. And so it, we really needed to be comprehensive and rigorous for the task force, and we had to have a way of dealing with the way the evidence was evolving. So. I would say the, the success, though, I, I want to say that the work that has been done with the task force and, and the ability to work with the task force for 17 years, um, I think, helped create the, the, the EPC. Because when you have longevity of funding uh, and you have uh, the long-term funding, it's possible to develop um, a team of dedicated, capable individuals. And I think the people that I have the privilege of working with are really, really talented and, and excellent. It also, having a partner gives you a clear context uh, for reviews, and it also, as I said, then because the task force was always forward-looking and driving towards public benefit in its recommendations, the decision context uh, drove methods. And um, so I think there, there are many ways that uh, the task force the fact that we had a critical mass of people really interested in this work in the Portland area, I mean, a huge, really critical mass that continues. And uh, the fact that we were at that part of the curve where the whole field was really developing, it gave us enormous opportunity to do methods. So we're going to, and remember, there's a question period afterwards, so uh, start to write your questions on three by five cards. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I presume that you have some arrangement later for the questions, so I won't go into it now. But with this, we're going to get off of the red line and go to uh, after you left the EPCs and went to work for PCORI as the chief science officer. Okay. Um, tell us about that. What drew you to it? Uh, anything else you want to say? And then we'll go from there. Yeah, you know, um, 
I think I think uh, it's always interesting once you have um, tried to get funding for a long period of time and competed for funding to to see what the opportunities could be uh, if you were actually in the seat of of, uh, of, of trying to responsibly um, allocate funds and so and also the the quarry as you know um, came out of the Affordable Care Act uh, which came after ARA, where we did a lot of work in comparative effectiveness research for the EPC program. Uh, the Effective Healthcare Program did so much work. And, um, and I think, you know, in a lot of ways, besides the, the pull of seeing what the other side was like in funding and hoping to make a positive impact, the idea of patient-centered outcomes research was really, really went back to, to my origin. So those were all things that got me interested in, uh, in going to the quarry. Well, let's, um, uh, earlier I asked you how your uh, primary research career at, at CHR affected your EPC work. Let's turn it to the next step. How did the EPC work influence your perspective as a research funder? I think that, <clears throat> I, I think it was, I don't know how you get the EPC work um, and the, the systematic perspective and the methodologic perspective out of uh, out of your head. Once you've gotten it, um, I think you it, it influences everything you do. So one of the things it did was as I moved from a primary researcher and I did systematic reviews, I really understood when I went to Bacori that the, the point was not to do the do studies. It was really thinking about creating bodies of actionable actionable evidence rather than just research studies. And when you start thinking about bodies of evidence, um, it, it really changes the way you think about soliciting and funding research. The, the second thing that um, the EPC program, I think, really was influential in terms of my role at PCORI was uh, PCORI was, um, had, uh, had, to need, had a need to demonstrate its impact, uh, understandably. And through work with the task force, and I, I'd love to talk about the aspirin topic where we, um, we, learned, we, we learned just in time to address urgent problems in a systematic manner. But bringing that perspective that the EPC program had really allowed me to hone, how do you create a, a systematic approach to a problem and uh, address it in a way that is uh, defensible, rigorous, and, uh, but is timely? I think was extraordinarily helpful. And a couple of examples about that. So we, we looked to um, one of the first things we did, and evidence synthesis was part of the PCORI uh, authorizing legislation, but we were looking to fill gaps rather than and, and not uh, reinvent the wheel. So we focused on knowing that updating was a big problem for systematic reviews, keeping things fresh and current. We worked on uh, early on creating uh, updates for CERs through ARC as one way of addressing urgent problems in a systematic manner and producing results. We also looked at evidence maps, which the, the VA had piloted um, and was really a, a leader in bringing more evidence maps and graphic displays to get uh, evidence to the point where it was actually usable and understandable by people. So all of those were influences. I got very interested in core outcomes and how we might uh, begin to, um, instead of the problems that we were hitting as systematic reviewers where you, it was hard to combine things because they were measured in very different ways, thinking about how we might define outcomes at the outset um, and create consistent protocols so that when we went to synthesize evidence, we actually had more of a body of evidence rather than a bunch of heterogeneity. Those were all ways that I think the EBC program was profoundly important in, in my thinking. And finally, I would say, and this is where I'd like to talk a little bit because I think there's still a lot of work that can be done here. As I went from a researcher to a research funder, it really became clear to me that there were different levers. Uh, I always believed research is the lever for improving health. And I think all of us, I can't speak for everybody, but I believe I dedicated my career to research because I wanted to improve health care and health outcomes. And I thought research was a great lever for that. But, but as we began to think about the larger ecosystem of research, um, I realized as a funder that we had a lot of great opportunities 
to uh, reduce waste and increase value. And I, I want to talk a little bit about building on the, uh, the series that the, has been in the Lancet and the Lancet has really taken forward in the reward campaign and how much um, that was important in my work at Macquarie. Good? Um, yeah, no, I, would, I just wanted to tell people, I mean, you're going to see this in a minute, but it, it gets to this research in, ecosystem. When, when Evelyn was at Picori, I would say uh, that was one of the I mean, highlights was getting involved or really taking the lead, I would say, on trying to get research funders behind this wasted research initiative yeah. and do something about it. So I thought it was, uh, we both thought it was good for uh, uh, to have a uh, sort of an extended a little bit of talk about this. Talk about this. So go ahead. There's and still work that. Yeah. yeah, I think there's still a lot of work that can be done. So the the link to the the uh, reward campaign um, is at the bottom of the slide, and and on the web page um, there is a when we started working internationally, really, because research funding, you begin to think realize the problems that we have that we're trying to solve with research. They're international. They're, you know, the, the, there are, you have to think globally and act locally, right? But, but there's a lot that we share, and if we can reduce duplication, even at an international level, we're all better off. So uh, the reward campaign is, I think, just a, a, a piece of genius work. And if you look at the people who, um, it's got long roots, but if you look at the people who really produce some of this work, many of them have uh, international connections to evidence-based medicine and some of whom have been influential in the EPC program as well. I added, there's a whole series of papers to look at, and um, what this one paper from uh, Chalmers and Glajou in 2009 in the Lancet series points out is, uh, I think those of us that are, have been systematic reviewers can see the through line to how uh, not using systematic reviews or systematic practices has led to research waste and, and perhaps not having the value we could get that we would like. So we under, all understand the importance of questions. Uh, Dr. Clancy talked about that, as did others. We know that from critical appraisal that appropriate design and methods are absolutely critical. And what you see in some of this paper was the estimate that had been made in this campaign of how much wasn't done well and therefore how much waste uh, was going on in research. We all know how important it is uh, for the file drawer, pro file drawer problem to be able to be sure that we can get uh, access to all of the negative um, studies and that we can understand what was done through the publications. And we all, we all know that uh, we really need to be able to find protocols and to make sure that we understand what was done. So this whole series of thinking through where we were missing, missing the point or not able to use the work that was done, I think is enormously important and was important when I was at Bacori. So the other, I think for me, brilliant thing that the reward campaign uh, laid out and the, was to really, within the end user need for research, to think about all the actors in the system. So we as researchers were, you know, get pretty focused on what we can do and we try and do our best, but recognizing that there are both incentives as well as disincentives, as uh, Dr. Poe talked about, with research institutions, and that there are levers in here where journals, research institutions, researchers, and regulators can work to make it easier to do the right thing. And my interest was really to use the funder lever because the funders have such opportunity to, um, to help, help the research enterprise be more effective. This is um, from my uh, colleague, uh, Kelly Dunham at PCORI. Um, after I left, we had helped fund uh, at PCORI the Ensuring Value in Research Forum. And this was international group of funders coming together to take those five quadrants, researchers, you know, research institutions, journals, um, and uh, regulators and funders, and think about not only what we could do in our separate quadrants, but where we might um, do better together. And this, uh, this kind of uh, illustration shows there are a number of international initiatives, and this doesn't get them all, but again, with the idea that if we collaborate, if we really work together to make sure we're, we're complementing rather than duplicating each other's work, 
and we, we deal, we close the gaps in the research enterprise, our work will be much more effective. So I, I found that the, the work and the thinking around the reward, the reward campaign was really powerful in my role as a funder, and I think it still has a lot of benefit of, that, that many of us can, can carry forward in our institutions. So our, uh, our rules here on eating and drinking is that if I want to have my tea, I have to not sit next to mm. here, so I go over there. Let me get further away from you. <laughs> no, no, you, you can, that's just the, the, the house rules, but you can, one of us can, can eat and drink while we're sitting here. All right. And, but two of us can't at the same place. So let me, let me just um, uh, introduce the next session of the uh, uh, interview or talk here. So we always want our uh, Grand Round speakers in this series to tell us about where they think the field is going, um, and um, especially with respect to ARC's desire, the EPC program's desire to work more closely in the future with a broad spectrum of decision makers, including health systems, federal decision makers, and yeah. others. And so I understand, so, so given that assignment, I understand that, that you, you did something really fitting for our last Grand Round session, uh, which is to look back at the other Grand Round sessions and use that as kind of the springboard for your insights of where we are going, where we should be going forward. Always a synthesizer. Always a synthesizer, <laughs> exactly. So with that, um, uh, let's take it. Uh, uh, Take it forward with the question, where do you see the field going? Um, so there were so many interesting concepts that were raised, and I, I, uh, I wanted to capture some of the main ones from all the speakers. Um, but the ones that I would like to build upon, um, I, there are three uh, groupings that I'd like to build upon. And the first is, uh, comes, came in the comments that other speakers had made about having a definite partner. I think David Atkins might have said that, focus on the end user and also focusing on the end user expectation. And so um, I've been thinking about how to capture kind of where the flow of the program might be going in the future as compared to where we were the last 25 years. And I think there's not a, a definite um, uh, kind of a tread, uh, pivot point but I would say we started in the beginning about getting it right. That was really the focus of, of a lot of what we were trying to do. And I think we've now understood that that is necessary, but not sufficient. We need to still get it right, but we've got to get it done. And so one of the ways we get it done is we really, we have partners, we know where the evidence is going, and we are meeting their expectations. I talked a lot and I didn't go into as many details as I might have about how the needs-driven work for the USPSCF really drove the methods development. But I think um, the more that the program creates partnerships, creates per partnership opportunities, because remember, part of what made the task force partnership effective was that we had stable funding. So we could develop depth of capacity uh, and we could develop expertise. So I think for the program, it's a challenge for the ARC program to create partnership opportunities, and it's an opportunity for the EPCs themselves to, within their local settings, say, what partner opportunities do I have? Or the skills that I have, really valuable skills I find, I've honed as a, a, an a evidence reviewer and a synthesizer can bring value um, to the people that are, are trying to make progress using research. I think um, meeting the... Sorry. <laughs> okay. Is that a fire timer? No, yeah. you, have, you have more time. Okay. Don't worry about it. Okay. So um, I think meeting the end user expectations, and this was really focused on by uh, Melissa McFeeters, by Neil Poe, by others, talking about we've got to really make sure that once we understand what we believe the evidence says, that it that it's clearly communicated, it's accessible and it's usable. And I think um, Melissa said it really well, what you say is important, how you say it makes it stick. And I think not even what we say, but what we show. 
the movement towards graphics, the movements towards letting people understand the bottom line while still having access to the details uh, is really important. And I think bringing in other areas of expertise, communication specialists, people who are specialists in presenting information visually um, are, are good partnerships for EPCs to make. And then I think we need to look to make handoffs. So um, we, I think in the, when I first started research, it was sort of like you put it out there and it'll get taken up. I think the gap in between research and implementation is clear, but the gap between research finding and next research, next important research that's gonna build a body of evidence, that requires warm handoffs. So we need to think about how we close the gaps, even in the research system, um, as well as enhancing the handoffs like the task force has done in uh, some of its dissemination work so that we get the evidence to the users and we incentivize the users in the ways uh, and the ways to use them, as Dr. Post said. So that's what I would say about uh, that kind of end user perspective that was brought up. The next one that was that I thought kind of grouped together was the discussion about, I think it came up so many times, timely, timeliness, trade-offs and barriers. And I think the timely and timeliness, I one of the early um, consultants to the EPC program here in Oregon uh, showed a graph that I've never forgotten. And it was of what was what's called the iron triangle of project management. And it's a triangle that shows three dimensions, cost, speed, and quality. And what the management consultant said, this is the iron triangle of, of project management. You can choose two. Well, we don't have the ability to, to just choose two. We are, we are trying to maximize these all the time in the EPC program. One of the ways we found to do that was by managing scope. We also found a way to do that by having good capacity, existing capacity, as I've talked about. But I think as we go forward, we have to continue to work on the timeliness aspect with automation, with other things that can take, can get us there more quickly. Uh, there are things like living reviews that can help us be more timely. But we also need to have the quality aspect, which be fit to the level of the decision. And, and Craig and I worked on this a little bit when we were together in the EPC program, thinking about whether we could empirically test the, uh, the times that a rapid review and a full systematic review could really do a head-to-head -head comparison and see when a rapid review might have taken you off track. So, but that kind of movement forward where we, and, and obviously, practically, as uh, Dr. Atkin said, we have to get there more quickly with shorter products. We just need to know what the confidence interval is around our results. So, um, and then uh, I would say as the final one, uh, besides timeliness and trade-offs, because we're always trying to maximize the good within fixed, some fixed limits. Uh, I, I had to talk about foundational scandals because Deborah Zarin's, that is one of the, my favorite things I've, I've heard. I love, I love that concept. And um, I think it also goes back to needs-driven research. If you look across the research enterprise and all the things that have made doing systematic reviews and evidence synthesis easier. They have come from uh, either problems or needs. And I think we continue to want to uh, improve our whole research enterprise, as I've talked about, and adapt our tools to what are gonna be the new challenges. Now, the challenges that are out in front of us are not maybe the same as they were in the past. I don't have the answers to this, but I will say to you that the pandemic uncovered problems in the healthcare system and that climate change and the impacts on health are going to exacerbate the kinds of cracks and, and situations that we've seen in the healthcare system. How do we bring the tools that we have as evidence synthesizers to bear in ways that are helpful and useful to some of the, the challenges that we're going to be facing as health systems, uh, as practitioners, and as really as, uh, as the world? And I think, um, so the uh, National An uh, Academy of Medicine is, um, has an upcoming session that's focusing on health system challenges that were identified through the pandemic. I think the opportunity for the EPC program to look at that kind of uh, analysis that NAM has done 
and see where the, system, the EPC system might be part of the solution uh, is one example of an opportunity. Similarly, um, uh, you know, thinking about where we might bring our skills to bear as we begin to try and shift to manage in the face of some of the climate change and the, and the stress on the healthcare system and on individuals, I think that will be important. I want to close and so we can go to questions, but I want to say that, and I can't, it won't let me. Oh, I want to go to a final slide that is the point that, um, will you let me know? Okay, great. This is my favorite slide from when I used to do trainings for new systematic reviewers or new institutions doing systematic reviews. I love it because um, it's women playing rugby. I love it because it, uh, it shows that though I'm here speaking today, um, there are many people in the audience that have equally valuable things to say. And the work that I did was really built on so many other people's great efforts. Um, it, research is always a team sport. I don't care if you're doing clinical trials. I don't care if you're doing uh, systematic reviews. Any, it's always a team sport. And many of the people, including the task force, the evidence, other evidence users that really helped us try and do better, uh, their work and wisdom is reflected here. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to have a chance to make some comments. Great. So uh, we uh, thanks very much, Evelyn. We we uh, we made some trade-offs as far as scope versus time, but we have plenty of time left for for questions. Um, Celia, can you tell us how you want to manage the question? Yeah, absolutely. So people actually can speak up or what? Yeah. What so um, I see a thoughtful question from uh, Sue Curry has come over the chat. Um, so Sue, you have an opportunity if you'd like to. Um, Raise your, or if you'd like to unmute yourself and share your comment verbally, you're welcome to, or I can read it out. And Celia, maybe we could uh, take down the slides so that we can see Mark and and Evelyn and and others who who uh, who speak up. It would be great. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh. Good, thanks. I looked at myself on camera and um, I've made an appointment for a facelift, but uh, so <laughs> I turned my camera off just for my own mental health. Uh, but I, I, I do, everybody saw the comment, but what I was uh, getting to um, is that uh, ARC and NIH uh, did fund a consensus study at the National Academies looking at developing a taxonomy for research gaps. Uh, and I'm sure all of my colleagues from the task force and the EPCs that are on here know the incredible frustration of updating topics regularly and continuing uh, to put out to the world that there's insufficient evidence to really make any uh, recommendation for or against a preventive service. And uh, I had the experience of talking with folks at NIH and um, the Office of Disease Prevention, and they kept pointing their fingers at the um, task force saying, the task force isn't telling us what studies to do. Um, and the task force, I think rightly says, that's not our job. So we thought if there was a common language uh, that uh, that might be helpful. And so my question was to um, Evelyn about whether she was aware of that work. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I'm such a fan of her and her clarity and keen mind. So I'd like to know what she thinks about that. Well, that I am so happy to see you. Hello, hello. Um, so, well, Sue, um, I am not aware of that particular work, and it might have posted. It might have been after some work I finished that is going to be coming out at the end of this year for the World Health Organization. I was asked to do work for their guideline. Uh, process to try and uh, systematize and standardize the identification of needed research. And I actually built, I did formative work to in, inform this. It's coming out as a chapter. It was, it was delayed by the pandemic, but it's coming out at the end of 20, 2022 or early 2023. And I actually just presented it at the Ensuring Value and Research Forum. But my point is this, I built on the USPSTF work and what NICE has done. 
those were the only two guideline developers that back in 2019 and 2020 when I was doing this work that had actually had any sort of handoff to uh, to funders or, or focus. We've always done the um, the future research sections, but we didn't have a lot of standardization or guidance. So I am really interested in the taxonomy because the language was quite difficult to deal with and we came up with an approach. But what I would offer is there we outlined a process that builds the identification of uh, future research, it's not a prioritization process, but it's a focusing process that standardizes it so that the guideline group has input, but then a short list of outputs come for the evidence that would be most influential in updating the guideline. So that's really the focus of the work, and it, there may be some value uh, for, for other guideline groups uh, with that work as it goes forward. It certainly also could, val could, could benefit from being more piloted, it's more conceptual at this point, but it builds right on the guideline process and integrates into the guideline process to take the outputs. Let me say one more thing about that, though, because one of the innovations, I, I added three things to the WHO process, but one of the most important things I thought was to require the systematic reviewers to produce a table at the end that looked at gaps, that was very, uh, very consistent, that talked about and, and it built off of critical appraisal and then talked about and, and then uh, complemented that with searches of existing um, trial registries and protocols so that you're, you also have a sense of what's already going on to address that gap. So it's not perfect, but it, it builds in to try and close the gaps as we've talked about in the, in the whole talk. Does that answer your question, Sue? Um, uh, well, yes. Um, yes and no. Uh, I, I would uh offline if there's some way to contact you i'll send you a link to this report because i thank think you, it's you. very complimentary and and perhaps uh some o overlap and uh Fabulous. you know it's just uh, i think that's really exciting um to know that uh that that work is being done uh this report was published um a, about a year ago Awesome. Yeah, no, it was, so it was uh, right in the, in the interim period. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that comment, Sue. Um, I had seen Tim Wilt's hand go up. Um, Tim, do you still have a comment that you'd like to share? I do. I do. Thanks. Hi. Great to see you. Well, good to Hi, see you too, Sue. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah, yeah. We all grow older together, right? Um, so um, thanks. Really nice. I wanted to build off your comment, get some response about um, data, wasteful data, uh, and need to get things done in an end user. Uh, and then also maybe just a comment on Sue's. Um, it is a challenge to figure out when there are gaps as to what the next research recommendation is, but I do think that's an important priority and opportunity for reviewers and even guideline members because, you know, they are the end user. They're the ones making the decisions or are hopefully objectively looked at and assessed all the work. So maybe not to be completely prescriptive, but they're the ones who hopefully best know it. But you mostly mentioned about reducing duplication. And, um, you know, that's important, although uh, replicability is a cornerstone to ensuring that uh, science is truth. But another aspect of it is um, the multitude of bad research. And when I, when we go with the, uh, the EPC program, we are increasingly, I think, being asked to turn over every stone. And to channel, I think, Bob Kane, he would say it's not to find all the evidence, it's find the evidence that matters. And your thoughts about um, how programs like EPCs can ensure their end users that sometimes more streamlined and simpler and focused is um, arguably better. Uh, it's just we get really enormous amount of workload and then the weeds of all the work that's out there that we eventually just say, I don't you know, it's bad stuff or try to filter it through. So thoughts on that? Well, that's a, that's a big area um, uh, and um, could, could get a lot of comments back. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, a couple things. I think the closer you are to the end user, 
the closer you are to knowing the scope of the problem. I think scope is one way that we have often gotten, we've tried to be everything to everybody and getting a tighter scope and knowing the focus of the decision um, is always helpful in that way. So I would say that. The second thing I would say is, and I tried to allude to this, but we need to match the rigor of the method to the requirement of the decision. I've had um, people in healthcare systems say, you know, they, they don't necessarily need the kind of precision that we require in clinical medicine. And so if we had a better gauge of the precision necessary for the decision, and further, if we had some empirical research that said, when we truncate methods, how often are we wrong? And do we have any predictors about what kinds of topics we go wrong in when we truncate methods? That would be enormously helpful. And then finally, I think um, David Atkins brought this up. The, the whole, some of the qualitative methods such as snowballing, where you begin, you start to see, have I got enough? Have I got enough? Am I hearing, am I finding something different? I think that we, we can probably benefit from bringing in some of those kinds of methods going forward. That's a very general answer, but I hope that, that addresses some of what you brought up, Tim. Okay, we have a next question. Celia, who, who is it? Yeah, um, Anjali, uh, would you like to share your comment? Sure. Hi. Uh, thank you for a really thoughtful discussion so far. I was also really in, taken with um, concerns around uh, duplication and wasted research. And, you know, for many topics, it's often the case that there's more systematic reviews than there are primary studies and of, you know, great variability in quality and um, even in, you know, outcomes and things like that. Do you think as the EPC program and at ARC more generally, we have a role to play around um, setting some standards for evidence synthesis, and if so, like how do we, how do we, you know, kind of take that leadership opportunity for? So, Anjali, are you talking about um, setting standards for systematic review or setting standards for primary studies or both? I didn't quite understand. Yeah, I'm, I'm more around systematic reviews, I think, because that's, you know, right in our sweet spot. And we don't do that many reviews or reviews, but, um, uh, but still there's a huge amount of effort <laughs> dedicated to systematic reviews that could be, could be useful. And, you know, we are the ones that kind of know what, what makes a, a very useful systematic review uh, mm -hmm. compared to a less useful one. Mm -hmm. Wow, I think, well, if I understand your question, I feel like the work to do a good quality systematic review is one area where Cochrane, you know, the EPC program internationally, people have worked on trying to get that right. And, um, but I think what Tim was pointing out and maybe you're pointing to as well is the is is the need to figure out when we can perhaps ad, adjust or adapt a little bit in order to do something in a more timely manner that still has has credibility and is useful uh, and is in a reasonable cost frame. And so I do think that that movement to and and certainly Cochrane has come out with some good uh, recent guidelines on rapid reviews that have been done in a consensus manner. So there's, the international community is working on these areas of methods. I think what I would also say, and it gets back to where I thought your question might go, which is the quality of primary research. This is where understanding the research ecosystem is really important. Journals have done more to improve and along with the kind of the requirement that journals have taken up from Equator that there be reporting standards. I think they've done more the, um, than uh, many have to improve the quality of primary research, which helps us as synthesizers. The other thing that's helped a lot is trial registries because not only can we find things, but people, there's some accountability for changes in protocol. So all of those things have been enormously helpful in improving uh, research that goes into systematic reviews. Um, and, uh, and so I kind of answered both the questions, even though you might have asked, asked most about systematic reviews. So we have, we have a lot of questions Thank in you. the chat. We won't, oh, sorry, yeah, we won't be able to get to them. Can you um, 
can we browse a little bit? And uh, the rest that we don't get to, we'll send to Evelyn. I'm sure she'll uh, respond. But um, there was one about community-based participatory research. There was uh, a few others. Can we um, find Well, I can't those? read them. They're scrolling too fast. Uh, no, no, yeah. That's the one, yeah. Do you think, uh, go ahead and want to read it? Yeah, um, do you think community-based participatory research can have more of a role in systematic reviews, or are there principles from community-based participatory research that could be extrapolated to evidence synthesis? Hmm. Wow, I'd love to hear more about what the person is defining as community-based participatory research. And <clears throat> because to me, community-based participatory research is has to do with how the, so I may not be understanding, but my understanding of it is it's how a partnership that goes in place in order to both generate research questions, design the research process, and conduct the research. Um, so I'm not, so if that work is done, then it certainly, I don't see any reason it would not be incorporated in a systematic review. So maybe I'm not understanding the question. Um, certainly, if you talk about the principles of community-based participatory research and you go back to the engagement of stakeholders, such as the EBC program has done, PCORI has really moved the needle on engaging people. I think, you know, those are perhaps what you're talking about, the principles that might come in, and certainly there are great roles for uh, engagement in evidence synthesis. All right, folks. Well, um, Evelyn or Mercy, you want to say a brief closing comment? No, um, that was I take it that was really fun. That was great, and yeah. really, uh, particularly, uh, well, there were a lot of things that were good, but but uh, I'm uh, figuring we don't have a formal close. Do I we? have a I have a few brief comments. Uh, yes. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. And I had wanted to make sure yeah. um, that you all had an opportunity before I jumped in. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> okay. I thought so. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, Thanks, do, everyone. Yeah. yeah, I do want to give a really um, wholehearted thank you for your thoughtful remarks and synthesis of our whole Grand Round series. Um, so this is the final official session um, celebrating 25 years for the EPCs. Um, so I really want to thank uh, the audience for your engagement, um, for your attendance and thoughtful questions. I want to thank all of our speakers. 